Welcome to the online tour of the Exploring the Arctic Seafloor Exhibit. In the next few minutes, I will give you a guided tour of the photographs that chronicle this historic expedition to the Arctic Ocean. The exhibit is divided into four main sections. The icebreaker, the environment, science in action, and scientific results. Leading off the icebreaker section is this photo of the Swedish icebreaker Odin, shot from the ship's helicopter. This 350-foot long ship served as both laboratory and home for all 59 of us on this 40-day expedition. The icebreaker easily pushes aside small flows known as pancake ice. As the ship moves forward, the ice closes behind like a giant white zipper. Even though you can't tell from the light, this was shot at about 4 in the morning. Ice that's been frozen for more than one year becomes thick, hard, and blue. This multi-year ice can sometimes stop even an icebreaker in its tracks. I never got tired of photographing the ice chunks sliding by the side of the ship. This helicopter is the ship's eyes above the ice. Several times a day, the ship's navigator flew ahead to scout for leads, or pathways of open water between the ice flows. The crew placed ice beacons near the ship to detect the direction and speed of the shifting ice pack. I only had a few seconds to compose and fire this shot. The flight crew was in such a hurry that the helicopter was left running while the co-pilot and I ran out to get the beacon. This slide leads off the environment section. In summer, the surface of the ice becomes pocked with ponds of melted snow and ice. This is one of my favorite shots because it puts the scale of the pack ice in perspective. It's this massive, flat expanse of blue and white, and we're just these tiny little ants crawling on the surface. You may have heard the Arctic described as harsh or desolate. This couldn't be farther from the truth, especially in the summer, when there's a population explosion throughout the food web. In this shot, the icebreaker has stirred juvenile cod to the sea surface, creating a feeding frenzy for black-legged kittiwakes and other seabirds. At the ice edge, polar bears were stalking their prey, ringed seals. Polar bears are threatened by climate change. As the sea ice shrinks, so do the bears' hunting ground. Polar bears and seabirds weren't the only beautiful things we saw in the high north. A colorless rainbow or fog bow arcs over the Barents Sea. The fog's droplets of water are too small to refract light into separate colors. The weather at 80 degrees north is an unpredictable mixture of sun and fog. When the sun shines, the temperature can climb into the upper 30s Fahrenheit. The water is often glassy since the ice prevents waves from forming. Above the Arctic Circle, in the height of summer, the sun swings around in a giant circle overhead, never setting. This was the lowest the sun got towards the end of the cruise in August in the Beaufort Sea as we were returning to Norway. Sea ice forms from the freezing of sea water. Ice that forms over a single winter grows to 6 feet thick. Ice that survives several years can become 10 feet thick. The next section of the exhibit is what I call Science in Action. In this section I show how scientists did their jobs while most of the science was conducted on board, a team of researchers from Germany set up a network of seismometers on the sea ice. Their mission was to record earthquakes occurring on the seafloor two miles below the surface of the ice. To search for hydrothermal vents, scientists used four different instruments. The first was the Conductivity Temperature Depth, or CTD, rosette. This measures the temperature and saltiness of the water, as well as collect water samples for further analysis in the lab. This is the view from the deck as the CTD is picked up and put over the side. The gray bottles, called Niskin bottles, collect water samples from different depths. After a trip down two miles underwater, the CTD rosette is pushed into the ship's lab. Chemical analyses conducted in the lab help determine if hydrothermal fluids are present in the water. Chief Engineer Hanuman Singh left and his team developed two robotic vehicles to scout the seafloor. Rather than being tied to the ship with a cable, these vehicles can swim a pre-programmed mission. This is Jaguar returning from a ballast test. Chief Scientist Rob Reeves Sohn and Wright nervously waits for messages from the robotic vehicles. Engineers communicate with the free-swimming vehicles using pulses of sound. A typical mission to the seafloor can take 12 sleepless hours. The biggest challenge in working with vehicles under the ice is getting them back. It's a lot easier to retrieve a free-swimming vehicle if it surfaces in open water rather than under ice. To prep for a recovery, the ship turns up a football field-sized area of ice. I used a fisheye lens for this shot to include the entire path of the ship. 
Engineers used a handheld avalanche beacon to search for a resurfacing vehicle, the same technology used by rescuers to hunt for skiers in an avalanche. This shot is the signature piece of the exhibit. It shows the classic epic struggle between man and the environment. It was one of the most tense moments of the cruise. Engineer John Kemp retrieves the robotic vehicle Puma. The vehicles are in constant danger of being crushed by shifting ice when resurfacing from a dive. If you thought that recovery was tough, check this out. Landing on a flow not much bigger than the helicopter itself, co-pilot Gear Axie hooked a line to the robotic vehicle. The helicopter then gently picked up the delicate instrument and delivered it to a safe pond near the ship. At sea repairs are a way of life on oceanography expeditions. The nearest hardware store is over a thousand miles away. This is John Bailey repairing the vertical thruster on one of the AUVs. Engineering students test a video camera to be mounted to the camera sampler or camper vehicle. I asked them to point it at themselves to capture this unusual portrait. Tim Shank is a deep sea biologist, but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty doing some engineering work. Here he is working under the hood of Camper, which collects seafloor rock and water samples and shoots high definition video. Once an interesting area on the seafloor is located using the CTD and robotic diving vehicles, the crew deploys Camper. From inside a control van, they can operate the grab and suction samplers when they see something interesting on the seafloor. It's always an exciting time when Camper comes back on deck. These samples are priceless data. Scientists crowd around a rock sample that Camper has brought back from the depths. The fourth and final section of the exhibit focuses on results. In this photo, Camper, Camper's suction sampler collected yellow-orange microbes from the sea floor. Genetic analysis will tell researchers more about these mysterious organisms. And the final shot is a picture of some lava fragments from the Gackle Ridge. Thanks for taking this tour with me. If you get a chance, try to visit the Arctic Seafloor exhibit in person. In addition to these photos, there's a 3D model of the Arctic Seafloor, a multimedia kiosk, images of the seafloor captured by Camper, and informative panels. Thanks.